this uh, meeting to order. Uh, this is the uh, Jobs and Economic Growth Finance and Policy Committee. Today is Monday, March 28, 2022. Members, we have uh, five bills on the agenda today. Our first bill is a Senate File uh, 4114. Senator Chamberlain, welcome to the committee. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. There's no, we have no amendments for this bill. This uh, day idea was brought to me a few weeks ago uh, by, by um, the testifiers here and Kari over there. We discussed something similar probably a year or two years ago as well. Not exactly the same as this, but something similar to it. So what we're talking about here today in summary is about employees, ownership, jobs, and transferring wealth, keeping it here in Minnesota. Jobs, employees, keeping those here in Minnesota and helping to generate wealth by creating a partnership, public-private partnership, and it's not a giveaway, and that's the best, that's another good piece about this. Um, so as you know, uh, uh, owners, they'll have businesses, uh, usually smaller businesses, and at some point they may want to sell those businesses, uh, pass them on to somebody else. Um, and the testifiers will bring some numbers and data to that. Uh, so there are benefits to this sort of plan to help keep those businesses and, again, those employees here in Minnesota along with that wealth uh, that creates, uh, there's an opportunity created by, as many of you are aware, a lot of baby boomers getting to a point where they want to uh, sell off their businesses and retire and, and do probably things that are more fun to them. Uh, a lot of them don't have succession plans necessarily. So part of the plan here is to provide some initial start startup capital, low interest loans, and we'll get to that in a minute. And as I mentioned before, uh, uh, public-private partnership. So the bill itself, how it works is, as you see, there's the, the regular definitions. We're working through deed. So we require, and there's targeted groups and program, the program and targeted groups, um, establishment, uh, the, so the, the uh, commissioner will establish this grant program, applications and process. Um, there are partners. So what it does is it creates community partners. Money goes to the commissioner, the commissioner sets up a process and program according to the statute, get some rules and regs around it. The community partners are, let's just say, financial institutions typically, but they could be other organizations as well. And the requirements for those uh, partnerships and organizations are laid out in the bill as well on page two. So it's just not any Johnny come lately. It's, uh, it's uh, some parameters and definitions around it. So they're legitimate, credible institutions. So then those partners will uh, get the money They'll make low interest loans. The low interest loans will be targeted to particular groups, underserved groups, underrepresented groups, and that is also defined in the bill. Uh, again, by doing this, we, get, we create jobs, keep those jobs here, keep the wealth here, instead of those businesses just disappearing. And a lot of these, uh, as we'll learn, a lot of these businesses don't have succession plans. <laughs> There's a limit, a uh, floor, and a ceiling to the amount of uh, to the amount of the loan. Um, finally, there are um, uh, reports, of course, that the commissioner of deed would have to submit to the legislature tracking this program. And finally, of course, there's money, and as you see on page four, there is money required from the state in the grant. Um, that is, of course, negotiable. Whether it's in the base, also negotiable. But the money would be essentially seed capital, goes to the community organizations to be loaned out to targeted groups, low interest loans, the money comes back. So uh, this is not an ongoing $15 million uh, expense. It's kind of a one time, and then with a little bit going on according to the, what we have in the proposal now to continue feeding the program. So that's it, members. That's all I have. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. Uh, before we take questions, we'll hear from uh, Ms. Gardner. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and then feel free to begin when you're ready. 
Chair Pratt, members of the committee, I'm Elena Gorder. I am the president and CEO of MCCD, which is the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers. MCCD is an association of 50 nonprofit organizations working in the affordable housing and economic development space. We are also a community development financial institution serving the Twin Cities metropolitan area. Our mission is to work in partnership with our members and with other stakeholders to build strong and stable communities and strong local economies. However, we can only achieve this by ensuring that economic development policies at every level of government support black, indigenous, and people of color communities and other marginalized communities in accessing capital and opportunities to build wealth. One of the ways that we're working to do this to advocate for more resources is to support shared ownership models. Earlier this year, we launched a shared ownership fund to provide low cost financing for the development, acquisition, and conversion of employee owned companies, cooperatives, and commercial land trusts. We're also leading efforts with other partnerships across Minnesota to expand access to resources. So the Community Wealth Building Program, established through Senate File 4114, would help entrepreneurs and businesses owned by these targeted groups. So as many of you may know, entrepreneurs across the state have challenges to accessing resources and often challenges to um, operating traditional business models. Some would rather um, just share the risks and reward with others by going into employee ownership and other cooperative structures. This is why it presents a solution. So some fun facts as Senator Chamberlain talked about. So in the, if 30% of all US businesses were owned by its employees, the average black wealth of a family would go from 24,000 a year to $106,000 a year. And the bottom 20% of earners, they're wealth would quad, it would quadruple, 20% would quadruple. Yeah, that's a hard, hard thing to say. I'm um, getting at some of what you talked about in terms of um, succession planning and the number of businesses owned by baby boomers. In Minnesota, 52,000 companies are owned by baby boomers. That is 599,000 jobs. And so the ability to retain those jobs and businesses can happen through employee ownership. Um, in terms of commercial land trusts, this is a way to provide perpetually affordable commercial ownership space and remove it from the speculative market. So a one-time investment, public and private, philanthropic investment, ensures that properties remain affordable in perpetuity and that the investment stays in community. So because D doesn't work directly with small businesses, the program would select CDFIs and other nonprofit economic development organizations as grantees through a competitive process. Grantees selected would provide low interest loans, financing for employee owned businesses, cooperatives and commercial land trusts with the ability to use 10% of the amount for technical assistance. So the CDFI and other nonprofit organizations that are selected would loan out the funds and could retain 50% of the principal repayment while um, the remaining amounts would be repaid to deed. The repayment portion the grantees retain would cover costs of low interest finance servicing, future technical assistance, marketing of shared ownership, and also um, further supporting by leveraging other resources. So in summary, financial resources through the Community Wealth Building Grant Program have the potential to change the landscape of small business in the state of Minnesota. It would also help to close the racial equity gap, which is we all need solutions for. So we see this program as a complement as well to other deep programs at the state. And so i just thank you, Senator Chamberlain for carrying this bill and for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gorder. Uh, next, we have Mr. Ruddy from uh, Terra Firma. I think he's on, there he is. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Pratt. Um, thank you, members of the committee. My name is Marty Ruddy. 
Um, <clears throat> I'm the current president of Terra Firma Building and Remodeling Cooperative. Um, I'm the founding member, uh, and I'm here to speak, uh, I think, as an example of a business and a cooperative that went through a transition. Uh, I was the sole owner of uh, Terra Firma Building and Remodeling for 14 years. Um, and then in 2013, we transitioned ownership to a cooperative model. That's the employee ownership model. Um, and so uh, Kari uh, and Elena asked me to speak a little bit about kind of what the reasons were and kind of what's happened uh, to our business since we transitioned. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons was I really wanted the company to reach its, its, its potential. Uh, and I felt that having owners, uh, the workers be the owners was one of the ways to do that. Uh, I also wanted to share in the, the success uh, of the company and also the responsibility of the company. Um, you know, I, this was, uh, at that point in my life, I had two kids and was married and, and as many entrepreneur, entrepreneurs know, uh, it's a, it's take, the business takes a lot of your energy and time. And I felt like sharing in the responsibility would be a good way for me to keep my family together and, uh, you know, have a good work-life balance. So we took this step uh, starting in about 2011 to research how to transition to employee ownership. Um, we did actually have a hard time finding technical assistance within Minnesota. We worked with people in Massachusetts. We worked with people in Ohio and Madison. We did work with uh, Margaret Lund here in Minnesota. She was instrumental uh, in helping us kind of figure out some of the technical details. Uh, we had another firm out of Chicago that helped us. Uh, but it was a challenge. So we did get to the to the point where I was able to sell the business to the employees. Um, I am also one of the owners, so I kind of sold it to myself in a way. Um, the advantages that I had, it was interesting hearing you speak at the at the early part of this. Um, we I was in a position to do all the financing myself. Um, and so I could see a lot of owners wanting to do this, but they can't, they don't have the ability to finance the sale. Um, so I was able to set the co-op up for success that way. Um, and then also we were, I was in a position to pay for the research on how to do it myself. And I think a lot of business owners would struggle with that. Um, so anyways, that was just a little bit of a like, hey, I think this grant program is awesome because it really would help. It was a, it was a big deal to, to make this happen. And we had to keep scratching and keep digging to get it figured out. It was not easy. There weren't a lot of examples. Um, but just like some of the things that I think are important to highlight about our business is when we did the conversion, we were doing about $5 million a year in sales. Um, since then, we're, uh, we just did $10 million last year, and we're going to keep growing. Uh, we had, at that time, 18 employees. We now have 32 employees. Um, since then... In additional, uh, what's called patronage allocations, which is kind of the profit part that gets paid out to the owners. Since 2013, we've transferred over $3 million in profits to these owners. So this is, you know, funds that would have originally just gone to the sole owner are now going to the workers. On top, that's on top of their, their you know, their salaries and, and wages. Um, so anyways, we're, you know, committed to being here in Minnesota, and I think it's a great model. And if anybody has questions for me, I'm happy to, to answer. Otherwise, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Ruddy. Uh, any questions for Senator Chamberlain or any of our testifiers? Seeing none, Senator Chamberlain, I think you guys covered it fairly well. Well, uh, thank you for the time and opportunity to speak. I owe the testifier Two bucks because I thought somebody would call me Senator Champion today and it did not happen. So, so I lost two bucks on that. <laughs> yeah, much more handsome. Thanks. Um, so thank you for the time and opportunity to present this. Um, uh, these are good ideas. I, you know, we always, we, you know, we don't like a lot of government involvement, but public-private partnerships can work and. This one actually pays back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Chamberlain. The uh, uh, Senate file 4114 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you.
Uh, next, we have uh, Senator Jasinski, Senate File uh, 1547. Nice job, Senator Chair. <laughs> Welcome to the committee, Senator Jasinski. Uh, feel free to begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, today I have Senate file number 1547. Uh, what this would do is ask the Department of Labor and Industry to study the police disability benefit uh, adequacy. Uh, this bill was bought, brought to me by, by Ms. Wolf, who's uh, seated next to me, who I'll let testify here shortly. Uh, but this is a very important bill uh, brought to me uh, actually uh, shortly after Eric Matson was shot and disabled. Uh, so the, the coincidence of things, or of, of not coincidence, but the events that brought forward to me uh, had some meaning to them. So uh, Senate File 14, 1547 is before you today. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Wolf right away to testify. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Wolf. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name... My name is Wendy Wolf, and the last name is spelled W-U-L-F-F. -F. My husband, Dan, was injured in 2005. He was the commander of the bomb squad for the city of Minneapolis, and he was injured by an explosive blast during a training exercise. And a few years after he was injured, we found out that if you are permanently totally disabled in the line of duty, there's a loophole in work comp law that allows your employer to stop paying wage loss benefits after two years if you're not old enough to retire at the time that you get injured. So what happens is the people who have lost the most from an injury get the least help, which really didn't make any sense to me. And so I went to the Pension Commission and Mary Liz Holberg, Representative Holberg and Senator Pariseau carried a bill that would close that loophole. And the Pension Commission at that time said that they were concerned about doing a fix like that without understanding the full ramifications. So they did a temporary fix for my husband, making his pension go from 60% to 75% with the, the plan to do a study to see the magnitude of the problem and be able to really quantify the solution and make sure that it wasn't too expensive or the wrong solution. And the uh, the Executive Director of PARA at that time, Mary Bannock, agreed to do this study, but right after that is when the, the economy collapsed and the pension fund collapsed and they had other things on their mind and so she just didn't do the study. So I've been coming back and warning of this problem. I, it came up when Chris Dewey was injured because he was going to fall through that same hole in the, until he passed away. And now it's come up again with the Matsons. In fact, nobody told them about this hole that they're going to fall through this year until I met with them. It's not something that's commonly known amongst police officers. And there's been several changes to pension law since 2008 that have made things worse because at the time that that original plan was done, pensions went up 3% or 2.5% per year, and that was decreased to 1% maximum increase per year. They also took away automatic survivor benefits, which if you want to keep those survivor benefits, you lose 10% of your pension when you turn 55. And uh, we've had, obviously, the, the big increase in inflation this year, which is making that fall farther behind. And also there was a, a Supreme Court decision that said that if you're old enough to retire when you get hurt, you can still get all of your wage loss. It's not offset by your pension. So people who are at the end of their career and are severely injured get way more help than people who are at the beginning of their career and get severely injured. In my husband's case, even with this correction to 75% instead of 60%, his pension is $16,000 a year less than the income of a rookie police officer who does no overtime. And it's half of what his pension would have been if he was healthy, and he could have then gotten another job. He had a standing order, uh, opening for a job down at the National Bomb School in Huntsville, Alabama, to make another salary and another pension at age 55. So 
it doesn't make any sense. The people who are risking their lives and are getting hurt like this should be taken care of, but what's happening right now is you are guaranteed to be financially destroyed if you are injured early on in your career. And both the Department of Labor and Industry and PARA are willing to do the study, but they say they need to be told to do the study in order to do it. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Senator Zelensky, I understand you have an A2 amendment to Senate House. Would you move the A2 amendment, So moved, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Zelensky, would you like to discuss the A2 amendment, or would you uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, this would add firefighters and the state troopers uh, to the same study for the same uh, type of issue they're having with the police. So uh, I think that's it, unless anybody else wants any more details, but pretty self-explanatory. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Zelensky, when I presented this bill on your behalf in jobs, this was certainly a concern that had, uh, well, it was a bipartisan concern, uh, especially around the firefighters, and then I know there was discussion whether or not troopers should be uh, included as well. So I'm glad that we were able to to wrap them all in, especially since the firefighters and the police officers are in the same uh, in the same medical group. So. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Do we have any questions um, for Senator Jasinski or Ms. Wolf? Uh, we also have um, Ms. Daly from the uh, uh, Department of Labor and Mr. Anderson from uh, P uh, PERA. Sorry, my mic wasn't on. Yeah. But. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Kate Daly. I couldn't hear you there for a few minutes. I yeah, that's okay. I was just introducing you that you were online if, if anybody had any questions. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I thought I heard my name. I was peeking in. Do we have any? I don't see any questions for anyone. Um, Senator Zizinski, any any final comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, oh, of wait all. a minute. I'm sorry. We do have to we do have to vote on the amendment. I forgot. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Uh, all those in favor of the A2 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. That motion carries. Senator Zizinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I want to thank you for filling in for me while I was unable to uh, testify in the original version, uh, original hearing. I also want to thank Representative Kosnick, who uh, was involved in this bill as well, as well as my co-authors, Senator Howe, Senator Hoffman, Senator Rosen, and Senator Pratt. And again, I think this is a very important bill. Uh, so thank you for considering it today and passing it. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Senate file uh, 1547 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator Jacinski. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Senate File 4153, Senator Weber. And Senator Weber, I understand you have an A1 author's amendment? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Senator Rarick, would you move the A1 author's amendment? Okay. With that, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Now that we've got the bill in the form that you'd like it, um, Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, pleased to bring you today Senate File 4153. In the southwest corner of the state, as in many areas, areas of the state, we run into a problem of having a lack of our uh, craftsmen workers, whether we're talking about electricians, plumbers, uh, construction trade folks, uh, and a variety of other trades. Um, and as a result of this, uh, we have uh, also encountered stiff competition from our neighboring states, uh, particularly to the West, whereby they have a program uh, whereby they pay for the tuition of uh, students to go into training and uh, come out without any type of college debt. Uh, as a result of that, uh, the mayors of southwest Minnesota have developed a program, a proposal, uh, whereby uh, we could have a pilot project uh, with some uh, workforce development money uh, and, uh, and actually have a program whereby we could produce uh, some of the same type of workers in the same type of format. And uh, we would then also be able to have uh, businesses who wish to contribute into this fund, uh, this uh, scholarship fund, uh, and eventually part of the plan is for them to be able to get a tax credit uh, for a portion of that contribution as well. Uh, we have a number of testifiers, Mr. Chairman, so I will not take any more time. Uh, first, I would like to turn it to uh, Mr. Simonson, who uh, will uh, further explain the program. 
Thank you, uh, Senator Weber. Welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. Simonson. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Eric Simonson. I'm a lobbyist with Flaherty and Hood, uh, today representing the Southwest Minnesota Council of Mayors. Uh, Senator Weber covered the bill very well. Uh, it, it's a new idea for Minnesota. It's kind of an outside the box. Um, and if you can think of this as a proposed solution to not just address the workforce shortage problem in Southwest Minnesota, but also hopefully to address uh, what we see as a shrinking population program in Southwest Minnesota. And it's not to say that these problems don't exist in other parts of the state, because we all know that they do. Uh, someday, perhaps, the way this bill is written, if this, if this works the way that we think that it will, this perhaps could be expanded to other areas of the state. Uh, but for right now, uh, this, is, this is a pilot program. It's intended to be five years in length with the uh, idea that we can get some experience about what the educational component looks like as well as the workforce requirement on the other end. Uh, the pilot is for 18 counties in the lower and upper Sioux Indian communities. That's basically the same footprint as uh, the Initiative Foundation that you'll hear from uh, a little bit later today. Uh, the funds are very simply appropriated by the legislature from the Workforce Development Fund to DEED, uh, who turns around and passes those through to the Initiative Foundation in the form of a grant. SWIFT, uh, the, the Initiative Foundation, will award the scholarships to eligible students in qualified programs. Eligible students are, are defined in the bill in front of you as either resident or non-residents. Keep in mind that one of our primary goals is bringing in people to this region that hopefully will stay. Uh, and those students must enroll at least half time in whatever program they're selecting. SWIFT will control the scholarship and communication with the Minnesota West campuses within that region. Um, and the Regional Workforce Development Board will play a key role by annually providing a list of high demand programs and jobs for each Minnesota West campus. SWIFT and the campuses will do work that they're already doing, but it will, it will be brought into this particular program in order to maximize employer partnerships and sponsors of, of students going forward. Uh, SWIFT will continue to manage the fiscal responsibility and how effective the program is and report back to the legislature annually. The key here to this bill uh, is students committing to a three-year employment with an employer partner that's physically located in one of those counties defined in the bill. Uh, again, what are we trying to do? We're trying to grow population as well as fill uh, a lot of those open jobs. And employers in, re in return, uh, in theory, will receive a full tax credit for their scholarship contribution. That conversation will have to uh, hold for another day when we get to the tax committee, but uh, that is the concept behind the bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, I know we've got uh, testifiers. I want to kind of run through some of the nuts and bolts, but I'd like to turn it over to Mayor Boston from the City of Liberty. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the committee, Mayor Boston. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Pratt and members of the committee. I'm Mayor Pat Boston, B-A-U-S-T-I-A-N, Mayor of Laverne, Minnesota, proud home of Senator Weber. Um, we have been working on this uh, a group of mayors for about a year and a half. We've uh, formally started meeting last fall. The uh, the issues of our of our Southwest Minnesota Council of Mayors was to gather and try to come together a consensus on working on issues that affect all of us. Our initial cadre of mayors was just regular, really uh, Worthington, Laverne, Pipestone, and uh, uh, Marshall. After we started getting together, the, the number one issue that we could all collectively come together and work on is the lack of our technical trades within our communities. As the mayor of Laverne the last 11 years, I personally know a lot of students that have went out to our neighboring state over to the uh, program that uh, South Dakota has. That program started in 2015. To date, they have sent 1,900 kids through that program. And one of the reasons they started that is they had a huge benefactor of $25 million into that program to kick it off. The biggest thing that holds us back from growth in Southwest Minnesota is uh, our economic development and the shortage of those skilled trades workers. I know four businesses just in Laverne that ha are sending kids to technical school and paying for it 100% out of their pocket just to secure workers for them. And they're doing it on a, a, a work share thing. So once they get back, they'll uh, forgive the loan over a period of three years. 
This is directly affecting their bottom line, and uh, one of the issues that we can all agree to in uh, the Southwest Minnesota Council of Mayors is that, that this lack of skilled trades definitely affects the economic growth of our communities and the populations of our communities. We have numerous kids. Every one of us knows personal examples of our businesses that are um, not growing because they see kids leaving to South Dakota. So this is a start of a program. One of the issues that we're working on will be back, but we figured we'd take one step at a time and, and start working on this program. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, next we have uh, Mayor Burns. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Bob Burns. I'm mayor of the city of Marshall. I'm in my 30th year of uh, serving as mayor. Previous <clears throat> testifiers have outlined the bill uh, very well, and also uh, Mayor Boston has outlined the, the purpose and the need that we have. I will just reinforce, in southwest Minnesota, we are a uh, area of the state that is adjacent to a state that is aggressively marketing in our area, aggressively marketing not only for our young people to move out of Minnesota into that state, but with the for to serve their workforce. But when the workforce moves, eventually our employers will move too. So we, as the Southwest Minnesota Council of Mayors, we have um, had the mission of how do we mutually address an issue that affects all of us. And this is uh, one of the issues that uh, that we think will be a solution to one of those problems that. We we can retain our young people, provide them an education, uh, and uh, and then provide a workforce for our employers that don't have that workforce. We all know that as our young people receive an education and they settle in the area for a period of two to three years, chances are they're going to stay in that area. We would like that to be Southwest Minnesota. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Next, we have Mr. Marquardt. Welcome back to the committee. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Scott Marquardt. I'm Senior Vice President of Southwest Initiative Foundation, and our geographic service area is outlined in the bill, and we wanted to be physically here today to show our strong support for this bill. We're grateful and honored to be named as the proposed administrator and manager of these dollars. Uh, we fully support this project, the work of the Council of Mayors, Minnesota West and all of the stakeholders that are involved. From our perspective, I'll uh, keep it brief, Mr. Chair. Um, functionally, uh, we have experience with scholarships uh, really since our inception for uh, uh, folks that are choosing to continue their education past high school and um, innovative ways where that might need to be converted to a different instrument or mechanism afterwards. So we fully stand ready for whatever methodology is outlined by the final bill here in the department and any other regulations that are involved. We're excited that this is a pilot and we look forward to being part of a pilot that's gonna be something pretty special for our region. Um, just a few things again to lift up what the testifiers have said before. In addition to all of the things that Mayor Burns and Mayor Boston lifted up, we believe this has great alignment with the career pathways investments that are being made in the region right now to not only re retain the talent that our companies need to be competitive, but to ensure a path into the future for the folks that want to call Southwest Minnesota home and all of the other workforce development efforts. Um, the competition with our border state to the west is real. Serving an 18 county region, we hear it on a weekly if not daily basis of what that means as uh, Mayor Burns talked about that the companies may leave if the folks do and we want to ensure that we have a mechanism in place to try to counter that and incentivize folks to grow their career and grow their family in Southwest Minnesota. Um, something else that I think is very special about this bill that should be lifted up is that it's grounded in data. Uh, won't go into the weeds on that, but there's a lot of analytics that'll be determined between us and Minnesota West as to where the scholarships are targeted. And we think that adds great value and ROI for the public dollars and the private sector engagement. Uh, that's something very special here, how businesses can engage, collaborate with philanthropy, with the college system, and with others too. So <clears throat> we think there's a lot that comes together here. And uh, finally, Mr. Chair and committee members, um, as we looked at this 
and all of the things that are coming forward for a pandemic recovery, past the relief programs, past some of the emergency room type of investments. We think this is what's needed for sustainable pandemic recovery to ensure our companies have the talent they need. So we're honored, we're ready, and we're hopeful that this continues to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and last on our testifiers list, we have Ms. Bendix on Zoom, I believe. Welcome to the yes, committee. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. I'm Carrie Bendix. I am the executive director of the Southwest Minnesota Private Industry Council and our regional workforce development board. In November, Southwest Minnesota set a record for the lowest unemployment rate in the state at 1.7%. That's 1.7%, extremely low. Uh, statewide right now, it's around 2.7%. These numbers really demonstrate that we do have an unprecedented labor shortage. There is an immediate and a significant need to not only attract workers to Minnesota, but to retain our current and future workforce. Employers in Minnesota, as has been mentioned, not only face the labor shortage in Minnesota, but they're competing against our neighboring states who are actively and intentionally recruiting um, Minnesota students and workers out of Minnesota. Um, so the legislative proposal today will help offer the same opportunity to students in Minnesota, here in Minnesota, that is being offered in our neighboring state. Statewide, uh, for the class of, of 2022, the high school graduating class, 18% um, of the, those students who enrolled in college enrolled in out-of-state colleges. Here in our Southwest economic development area for the same year, it was 28% of those students enrolled in out-of-state schools. So that's a 10 percentage points higher. Um, it's really imperative uh, that we invest in those occupations that are high in demand because um, the labor shortage will only grow worse if we don't help individuals access the training that they need uh, so that we can fill these skilled labor force needs. Uh, kind of occupations, um, you know, healthcare is really huge in our area, as well as the construction trades within manufacturing, uh, maintenance machinery and me mechatronics. Um, but it will also help pay for uh, cr credentials such as a commercial driver's license. There is a significant need for heavy and tractor trailer um, truck drivers. This education uh, does it, does, doesn't really get financial assistance. It is, uh, there's training that helps prepare people for the driver's license or the commercial driver's license costs between four to $6,000, uh, depending on how much training behind the wheel a person needs. Uh, so this type of scholarship fund will really help us address those needs. We have 22 students as part of our, uh, the regional economic a uh, regional development education district out of the Minnesota Valley uh, that want to get uh, a CDL right out of high school, but right now many of them don't have a means to pay for that education. So this would really help uh, fulfill that need. Uh, so Southwest Minnesota is, is a significant part of our Minnesota economy. We're a national leader in agriculture production and renewable energy. And by Really, and we have a huge manufacturing industry. By investing in this pilot program, uh, you'll help retain workers here in, in Minnesota uh, and also meet really significant needs that we have in the labor force. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bendix. Any questions for Senator Weber or his testifiers? And I did forget to mention, members, we do have a quorum. Any questions? Uh, Senator Weber, you, you list um, a tax credit for businesses that contribute to the scholarships. Are those scholarships being uh, offered today and to maybe talk about uh, uh, making sure we still have that, that employer uh, uh, participation? Mr. Chairman, yes. Uh, the, the bill still includes um, a local employer scholarships tax credit. And, um, and of course, we will need to work that through the tax committee at this point. Uh, basically, um, this would be 
Uh, it's limited to the lesser of the following amounts. So there's a black blank line there. This is on page four of the bill. And or the total amount of a local employer scholarship awarded to an employer sponsored applicant or I suppose to some other uh, hybrid uh, formula that the tax committee may come up with at some point. But, um, but certainly it is the plan for that to be included in that as an incentive for employers to contribute to this. Thank you, Senator Weber. I, I think it's important that we continue to have the employer connection with this and, and I know you're, you've uh, duh, put a lot of work into making sure that that partnership still exists. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, seeing none, um, any final comments, Senator Weber? Mr. Chairman, members, thank you so much for the opportunity to present this bill. I think as has been indicated by the testifiers, uh, whether you need to call somebody to get your home repaired, whether you need to call somebody to get your, your car or your farm implement repaired, uh, quite frankly, all of those businesses are in need of people. The, the advertising for jobs is continual. And uh, they get a position filled, and then they're immediately advertising for another one. Uh, and uh, you know, quite frankly, those of us in the southwest corner of Minnesota have fought the battle for many years of neighboring states raiding our businesses. And uh, uh, right now, uh, they're in addition to that, they're raiding our workers to, to come over there, our young people to come over there for education purposes as well. And uh, this is certainly uh, another element that we need in our toolbox in order to compete, uh, in order to provide the services uh, and uh, ensure the success of our local businesses. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Weber. Uh, members, this, as Senator uh, Weber indicated, uh, this does need to go to the tax committee. So uh, Senator Drayheim, would you move that uh, Senate file 4153 uh, pass the committee as amended and be referred to the tax committee? So moved. Okay, Senator Weber, or Senator Dreheim moves, uh, moves the bill. Any questions or discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Weber. Members. Uh, next we have uh, Senate file 3922, Senator uh, Senjum. Welcome to committee, Senator Senjum. Just feel free to begin when you're ready. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. It's good to be with the Jobs Committee today and uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, an organization called Give Minnesota. Uh, it quite honestly is uh, an organization I hadn't heard of uh, un until, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago now. But uh, but we've all heard of Good Minnesota in the name of uh, the good to the, or, pardon me, give to the max day. Uh, uh, I think we all well recall uh, that particular day, that particular week when we're frankly inundated in a positive way uh, towards giving to uh, causes across Minnesota that, uh, that benefit our state in so many ways. Uh, 2021, the Give to the Max Day in Minnesota raised $34,400,000, uh, which I think is, is amazing and a, a positive thing for our state. Uh, it was divided among 6,500 nonprofits, and if you just simply do the math, that's about $5,000 per organization. I'm sure it was divvied up in different ways, but a, an extremely positive thing. And I think we all realize that uh, uh, government can't do everything, particularly in the human services area and, and a lot of other areas that we attempt to serve, but this vast array of nonprofits that we have out there uh, and the energy they provide through volunteerism and local organization is, uh, is something extremely positive for our state and frankly, uh, more than extremely positive. It's necessary for our state because the needs are so great. So, uh, so that's uh, Give to the Max Day and Give Minnesota. Another aspect of that, however, and the one I really want to talk to today relative to this bill is a, another segment of Give Minnesota. It's called Raise Minnesota. And that's a portion of this organization which deals with uh, nonprofits from the standpoint of, uh, of raising money, raising local money to local causes. Uh, I think we all are well familiar with nonprofits uh, back in our uh, communities. Uh, they're all well-meaning people. They work hard. They're cause-driven. 
but honestly, a lot of them uh, uh, fall maybe a little short in terms of being able to finance their organ or, or own organizations. Uh, they, uh, they, they want to, they just don't know how. It's, it's not their bent, so to speak, but Raise Minnesota uh, works in a coaching sort of way with local nonprofits. Many, many are very, very small uh, towards helping them meet their uh, financial needs on a local basis. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Madam, Mr. Chair and, and members, what, what this particular bill, 3922, proposes to do, and this is all scalable, but the proposal here is uh, to put forward $2 million to be matched with $1 million to uh, go forward uh, on this coaching uh, system that they have, uh, working with local nonprofits such that they might certainly raise more in their communities, and, and that uh, additional money would certainly then go to the causes which uh, they all have in, in so many different ways. Uh, and there's a list, uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, in your packet which just lists a, a small menu of, of those organizations across Minnesota that, that in fact are recipients of, uh, of the Give to the Max Day and to uh, the organizations that uh, comprise uh, and are, have been coached at least in the past by this raised Minnesota. So this, is, this, is, this bill is simply, let's just amp up our local nonprofits, teach them how to raise more money, teach them how to uh, avoid, if you will, being at witnesses, witness tables like this, uh, uh, taking care of their own needs to the extent they can on a local basis. That's what this bill attempts to do. It's scalable. Uh, I would offer that, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, if this bill goes forward, I, I do think there should be a reporting back component to it and that simple language that's nearly boilerplate in this place. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a good bill, and I hope that you give it due consideration. And I just want to then uh, turn my uh, uh, portion of this uh, presentation over to uh, my witness, and uh, he can proceed uh, uh, as you wish. Thank you, Senator Senjin. Welcome to committee. Mr. Tsava, please state your name for the record, and feel free to begin when you're ready. Hey, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Pratt and members. My name is Jake Blumberg, B-L-U-M-B-E-R-G, and I am the executive director of GiveMN. GiveMN's mission is to grow giving and ignite generosity across the state of Minnesota through our programs like GiveMN.org, Give to the Max Day, and RaiseMN. I'd like to thank Senator Sendrum for offering this bill, which will allow GiveMN to enable 1,000 nonprofits across Minnesota to become more self-sufficient and sustainable, while in turn positively impacting the Minnesota economy and employment markets. GiveMN is a nonprofit organization, 501c3 classification, founded in 2009. We are a nonpartisan, non-political organization that serves every 501c3 organization and public school across Minnesota. Regardless of their mission, we support their efforts to make our community stronger. As the committee may already be aware, Minnesota's nonprofit sector makes up 14% of the state's workforce. The vitality of the nonprofit sector in Minnesota is not only critical to our economy, but also is a core resource that cares for our neighbors and the communities that we all support. The committee may not be aware of the makeup of the Minnesota nonprofit sector. Nearly three quarters of Minnesota nonprofits have budgets of less than a million dollars. And according to survey research, nearly half of Minnesota nonprofits rely solely on volunteers for their fundraising efforts. Critically, 69% of Minnesota nonprofits are not confident their fundraising capacity is enough to meet their mission. In response to this landscape, we launched a program in 2017 to support the abilities of organizations, especially small volunteer-led organizations, to raise more money from individual donors. Raise MN is a coaching program to empower nonprofits to improve their own fundraising capacity. Rather than a consultant who does the work for them, and an organization, we teach the organization's leaders how to fundraise sustainably for themselves from individual donors. To liken it to a model we may all be familiar with, working with Raise MN is a lot like hiring a personal trainer to get, help you get in shape uh, and follow the right workout plan and diet. Unlike Give to the Max Day, Raise MN has an extensive application process which provides us with oversight to ensure the organizations we work with will use the support appropriately and responsibly as they build toward their own financial sustainability. Like all of Give MN's work, this application process remains non-political. Since Raise MN's launch, we have worked with more than 500 organizations across the state primarily smaller organizations, nearly 50% of them located in greater Minnesota. In the past year, 100% of the organizations we worked with told us that they had increased their fundraising confidence and knowledge from working with us. 
That led to increased fundraising outcomes from individuals as well. The support we offer organizations allows them to adapt to their landscape and makes them much less reliant on institutions like foundation and the government for funding, focusing their strategies instead towards the biggest renewable resource they have, individual donors. The organizations that we coach are now able to rely on donors in their communities rather than coming to the legislature every two years to ask for funding to sustain them, which we all know is not a sustainable model for those organizations. In many cases, this model also will allow organizations to hire staff, adding jobs to our economy as well. There are numerous examples of how this is positively played out with our clients, but the one I will highlight is the Duluth Children's Museum. In late 2020, due to the pandemic, they encountered a nearly six-figure fundraising crisis that meant they would have had to close their doors within 60 days, if not addressed. They relied on the training they had received in our program and raised over $180,000 from their community. A volunteer from their board of directors told us this. The only thing that kept me from having a heart attack and curling up under my desk in a ball as this was all going down was the fundraising training we did with Raise MN. I was confident in making my asks and felt sure in my abilities to fundraise. We respectfully come to this committee with a one-time appropriation request, which will help us work with 1,000 nonprofit organizations across the state. This one-time appropriation matched with $1 million of non-state funds will help small organizations become more independent and sustainable and less reliant on institutional and government funding. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for your time and consideration. I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Bloomberg. And I'm sorry I, I didn't, I skipped over a line and I didn't catch that, so. No problem. Uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Tasava. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Pratt and members. Uh, my name is Christopher Tasava, T-A-S-S-A-V-A. -S -S I serve on the board of the, of the Northfield Downtown Development Corporation. The NDDC is a, a nonprofit organization here in Northfield that uh, seeks to maintain our very distinctive and I think beautiful downtown. We're entirely uh, volunteer driven at this point. Um, so I'd like to thank Senator Senjim for authoring this bill, um, which gives, allows GiveMN to provide valuable expert assistance to nonprofits like the NDDC or the, the Duluth organization that um, Jake just mentioned. I'd also like to acknowledge that um, Northfield's own Senator Dreheim sits on this committee, and I'd like to thank him for his support of everything that we try to do in Northfield. Um, if you're not familiar with our town, I, I'd love to host you here to visit it. We have a, a wonderful little downtown along the Cannon River. Um, the heart of that downtown is Division Street, which has uh, numerous businesses of all forms up and down it. Um, our centerpiece event each year is the defeat of Jesse James Days each September, when we uh, celebrate the defeat of the James Younger Gain in, in 1876, when they tried to rob our bank. Um, along with many other organizations, the NDDC uh, plays an important role in assuring the vitality of our downtown. It's businesses, it's nonprofits, um, the retail organizations, the attorney's offices, et cetera. And we found that uh, give the uh, Give Amen has been invaluable in a couple different ways. In one, uh, Jake mentioned the uh, Give to the Max Day. That's been an important part of our annual fundraising for year in and year out now uh, across probably five or 10 years even. It helps us raise some of our revenues every year. But um, last year, we participated in the uh, Raise Amen coaching program that was mentioned too. Um, I've been in educational fundraising for almost 20 years now, and yet I still learn a great deal from our coach um, from GiveMN. She helped us understand our clientele better. She helped us understand uh, where we could be asking for more money in some cases or any money in other cases. Uh, we used uh, what we learned in the coaching program last year, already uh, last fall, and tripled the amount of money that we raised from our, um, our donors, our clients, really, in Northfield. Um, so that's one success. I'd like to point to a different success too that uh, GiveMN helped us with, and that's that in uh, November 2020, the centerpiece of our downtown, the Archer House River Inn, was a total loss in a, a tragic fire. This happened just at the beginning of the holiday season. It happened about six months into the pandemic's uh, economic downturn. But thanks to the fundraising we had done with uh, Give to the Max Day, we were able to uh, turn all those donations around and make many grants to the businesses and the unemployed uh, Northfielders who'd been displaced by that fire. So for those couple of reasons, I urge uh, support for this bill. I think that it would be a, a wonderful asset uh, across the whole nonprofit sector in Minnesota. Um, I can testify as I am here to the, the value of uh, everything that GiveMN does for the nonprofits. Um, and I'd happily stand for questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tassava. 
Uh, any questions for Senator Sengem or any of our testifiers? Senator Drahan. Thank you, Chair Pratt. And uh, yes, uh, members, Northfield, uh, great downtown. If you haven't been there, um, the college campuses are, are wonderful, of course, too. Um, but I had a question about um, the funding for Give MN. You know, how do you operate normally? Uh, I mean, how, how do you staff and, and help other groups without this appropriation? Can you just go into that just a little bit? How, how do you normally get, get funds to do the work that you do? And thank you for doing that work. Sure. Mr. Bloomberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Draham. GiveMN has been funded by um, private philanthropy, uh, foundations and institutions like the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundations, as well as individual donors and corporations. That's about 60% of the funding that uh, GiveMN uses on an annual operating year. The other 40% comes through two social enterprises that GiveMN leads. One is GiveMN.org. When donations are made, there are processing fees that pay for the costs of the website, as well as support our general operations. Rating. In addition to that, Raise MN uh, is offered at an hourly rate, um, which is the financial barrier we're actually trying to help scale and get over for many small nonprofits that can't afford it. And that social enterprise also drives uh, parts of our revenue. So together, 60% uh, philanthropy, 40% social enterprise, Senator. Senator Draham. So you, you charge like a credit card processing fee then for people that donate for you to help fund all, all your activities, that's kind of what I'm hearing, correct? Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, yes. So the way that um, our website operates is it's completely free of cost to nonprofits and schools to be able to use the website. There is a processing fee that is split between our platform, credit card processing, and give amends general operating. That processing fee can be covered by donors when they make the contribution to ensure 100% goes to their designated cause. And 94% of donors cover that fee, making the effective rate or um, cost on those donations to be less than 2% on processing. Thank you, Chair. That's Thank wonderful. you, Senator Draheim. Any other questions for Senator Senjum or any of our testifiers? Seeing none, Senator Senja, any closing remarks? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, just to say that uh, I understand, you know, this is the Jobs Committee that, uh, that works to uh, advance, uh, you know, growth and prosperity in Minnesota uh, in, in many ways through the profit sector. This is the nonprofit sector, and it's an important part of, uh, of the menu in terms of making Minnesota the great state that we are. And there's lots and lots of organizations out there working to do good work. Uh, this bill and uh, this particular uh, uh, request is simply to amp up what's already going on out there and, and make it better to make that $35 million, maybe $70 million at some point. And, uh, and uh, if we do that, uh, that's all the better for us. It's all the better for their state. So I hope you give it strong consideration. It's a worthy cause and, uh, they, and they do good work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sengem. Uh, members, Senate file 3922 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, members, our last bill is uh, Senate File 3986, Senator Duckworth. And I believe Senator thank Duckworth you, is joining us online. Yes, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, members of the committee, for the opportunity to present Senate File 3986. My apologies for not being there in person. And, Mr. Chair, I do have uh, the A1 amendment. Okay. Um, Senator Ucky, would you move the uh, A1 author's amendment? Uh, so moved. Okay. Uh, Senator Ucky moves the A1 author's amendment. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Senator Duckworth, to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill, as amended, would appropriate funds to the Commissioner of Employment and Economic Development for a study on the early childhood education workforce in Minnesota. The study would provide a consolidated source of up-to-date data on the makeup of the early childhood workforce, uh, er, uh, early child education workforce, wages, income, and benefits in the industry, and barriers to entering these careers or retaining workers in the field, along with information on any other relevant issues identified. Uh, at a minimum, the study would replicate the data points published in the study funded by the Minnesota Department of Human Services titled Child Care Workforce in Minnesota, 2011 statewide study of demographics, training, and professional development. 
It is to be completed within 18 months, and the commissioner may contract with another organization to complete the study. This is a one-time appropriation and is available until December 30th, 2023. And with that, Mr. Chair, I do have some testifiers that can further elaborate on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. First, we have uh, Ms. McCulley. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Ann McCulley and I'm Executive Director of Child Care Aware of Minnesota, here to speak in support of Senate File 3986. Um, this bill re reflects an interest from many partners. You will see a lot of letters of support posted on the website. And it is a top legislative priority of transforming Minnesota's early childhood workforce project, which is a public private initiative formed in 2016 to research, analyze, consider, and recommend policy issues related to the early childhood workforce. Uh, the reason for this bill, as you heard, is pretty straightforward. Um, we are, when we consider the needs of our early educators, or as I like to say, the adults in the room, we really do not know the current overall picture um, of who those folks are. The last comprehensive report, as you heard, was produced in 2012. And at that time, it really helped to set a baseline for things like uh, race, ethnicity, language, wages, benefits, you name it, um, of our workforce. And since 2012, some data has been captured, but it is splintered. And, um, and really, none of it really reflects the changes we've seen, of course, in the last couple of years due to the pandemic. So we really uh, can see the need for updating all of this data. The other thing I guess I'd point out is there's been um, some legislation passed in these last two years where the use of the data would be um, greatly beneficial. Um, one of them is there's the Great Start for All Minnesota Children Task Force, which Senator Housley helped to carry last year. Um, and that has one of its main focus areas, ensuring that Minnesota's early childhood educators are qualified, diverse, supported and equitably compensated regardless of setting. So unless we know where we're starting with those categories, it's very difficult when it comes time to implement some of the recommendations that'll be coming next year without knowing our starting place. Um, the other I would point out happens to be a program our organization implements, the Teach Early Childhood Scholarships, which are helping our early educators go back and get their degree. Many of folks working in the field do not have higher education degrees, um, or our retain grants, which help keep them in those positions. Um, because it is targeted to finding folks who are working but do not yet have certification or higher ed degrees, this would be a great chance to help us understand where to target, where to focus, that kind of thing. And finally, we're about to launch in Minnesota the One Stop Assistance Network and some other capacity building initiatives trying to bring people into the field, really encourage folks to come in and become family child care providers or work in early childhood uh, programs and centers. But again, better understanding what the demographics currently are so that we can really make sure we'll build, we're building a balanced workforce that meets the needs of the children and families in Minnesota is key. So I urge you to support this bill for a comprehensive early childhood workforce study and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, we'll take questions here in a moment. Next, we have uh, Mr. Ellis. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair and uh, committee members. Uh, my name is Kevion Ellis with Education Minnesota and I'm here to speak in support of Senate File 3986. Uh, Education Minnesota is committed to supporting Minnesota's earliest learners and the workforce that cares for them. Uh, we know that the earliest years of a child's life are the most important for cognitive, so social, and emotional development. Um, however, our early care and education system here in Minnesota is fragmented and underfunded. This bill highlights one of the reasons why um, the labor behind early childhood care and education is undervalued, uh, resulting in many workers in this space making poverty level work wages. Uh, this leads to increasing shortages and turnover, turnover rates that impact our most vulnerable populations. It is our hope that the legislature would uh, pass and use the results of this updated wage study to implement meaningful solutions aimed at creating a funding mechanism that raises the wages, benefits, and professional development of the early childhood workforce. I'll also note that part of the great start for all Minnesota's task force uh, that was just mentioned uh, that the legislature passed this last year was charged with looking at workforce challenges um, that impact our mixed delivery ECE system. These efforts, along with others, will likely point out the need for additional resources and investments into the ECE space and further supplement this wage study. 
Interventions through high quality early childhood care and education leads to lifelong profound benefits for children and their communities. Supporting the workforce behind it is crucial to its success, and I'd urge the committee to support this bill, and, and thank you for the time, and happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ellis. Um, also, I believe we have somebody on from DEED. Do we? Do we have somebody on from DEED? Mr. Chair, Ms. Casal is here from D, but I think she was here primarily to answer any questions. Okay. Yes, I'm here to answer questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do have a, a question for Ms. Casal. Um, I noticed our appropriation went from 255000 to a blank appropriation, and it's my understanding that D believes that, that they can uh, uh, maybe maybe perform this, this exercise. Um, when do you think you'll have an estimate of, of when that amount might be, might be available? I believe the fiscal note was completed um, late last week. I'm not sure what the process is after uh, it leaves deed. Okay. But I know it was due on the 28th, which is today. Okay. Any other questions for Senator Duckworth or our testifiers? Okay, seeing none. Senator Duckworth, any final comments? Uh, no, sir, Mr. Chair, just appreciate the time and consideration. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, with that, Senate file 3986 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, members, we have uh, one more meeting this week. We're gonna hear a Senator Champion bill and then uh, Deeds Agency bill. Uh, and then next week, um, hoping to get the final uh, jobs bill moved out of committee on Monday. Um, any questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll stand adjourned until Wednesday. Thank you.